Please welcome Michael Lomax, President and CEO of the United Negro College Fund, and Jamel Hill, Contributing Writer for The Atlantic. All right, thank you all for joining me once again. And thank you uh, to you, uh, Michael Lomax, for being a part of this conversation about historically black colleges and university. Um, I wanna start with an op-ed that you wrote uh, maybe a couple years ago where you talked about how uh, this idea that HBCUs were no longer relevant and how incorrect that was. Um, and it was very thoughtful uh, explaining, you know, why that couldn't be more untrue. Uh, however, that being said, HBCUs, the mission has certainly evolved. How would you say that the mission of these historically black colleges and universities have evolved? Well, you know, I would say at, at one level, the the mission of HBCUs has been the same for the 150 plus years that they've existed. They have been the first step on the ladder uh, to uh, education and opportunity in America. And as, as you know, uh, black colleges didn't exist uh, uh, early in the founding of the Republic. They <clears throat> Black people were enslaved. It was against a lot of teachers to read. Uh, and, uh, and as Frederick Douglass noted, that knowledge is the pathway from slavery to freedom. So these institutions were created as a part of that pathway uh, from slavery to freedom. Founded in the 1860s at the end of the Civil War, they were the places where uh, our, our, uh, the freed men and women got a chance to get the education they had been denied. And what did that education do? Well, it first of all enabled them uh, to live uh, more productively uh, in, a, in, in society, but it also enabled them to help to build the black middle class. It helped them uh, to uh, provide teachers and doctors and, and, and all of the other professionals that we need in our community. So they've been a foundation of our community. They were then and they are today. And the problem today is that, that uh, the, the narrative about HBCUs has been one of disparaging them, of devaluing them, and not recognizing the extraordinary uh, uh, results that they produce and the impact that they have every day in Black America. Yeah, I think I read um, a statistic recently where still in the American workforce, something like 40 percent of African-Americans uh, come from historically black colleges and universities. So obviously they still are very much embedded in the DNA of who we are uh, as a people. Um, that being said, for higher education overall, this, uh, this pandemic presented a lot of challenges. Uh, what were some of the challenges that you think HBCUs have had to survive uh, throughout this last year of being in this pandemic? Well, let's first of all just remember how many of them there are. I mean, you know, a HBCUs are three percent of all American higher education. Uh, they enroll about ten percent of all Black college students, but they produce uh, twenty percent of all Black college graduates and about uh, twenty-five percent of all STEM graduates. Uh, they're largely located in the, uh, the the South, where most Black people were enslaved, uh, and in the border states. And in those communities, they produce about, uh, you know, they produce even significantly larger percentages of, of Black college graduates. Uh, the, the, the pandemic really reinforced the fragility of uh, educational opportunity in the Black community, because uh, at, at historically black colleges, uh, you know, at 75 percent of all of our students are low income. About 50 percent of our students are the first in their families to go to college. Uh, they're on a journey to be able to achieve economic prosperity and security and stability. Uh, when the pandemic hit uh, and colleges had to shut down and they had to send their students back home and they had to rely upon uh, you know, using online education to complete uh, the, their academic year, uh, we saw that our students uh, had the least access to broadband. They didn't have the uh, iPad or the laptop at home that we would uh, that they needed to have in order to pursue their studies. 
Uh, and, and they didn't, and, and we just had a session here on housing, and we know the challenges that African Americans face in terms of getting uh, affordable housing in this country. So uh, the pandemic, uh, you know, really had the potential for uh, a devastating blow to HBCUs and to the students uh, that, that rely upon them for their education. And yet, despite those challenges, uh, with the conversation that we had in 2020 as a nation about race in a much different way uh, than we had before, I certainly noticed, at least anecdotally, a lot of Black people talking about uh, this desire for us to strengthen HBCUs and to return there. And matter of fact, before the pandemic, I wrote a piece for The Atlantic about how uh, high school prospects should seriously consider returning to HBCUs to help further strengthen that foundation. Given the racial climate in America right now, how do you think HBCUs can provide a, a bit of a safe haven for a lot of African Americans, a lot of Black students, period, who are feeling as if uh, they might be safer both physically and emotionally on Black uh, college campuses? Well, that's absolutely true. And I think a lot of those young people heard you, Jamel, because uh, what we are seeing and have been seeing for the last couple of years is increased applications to historically black colleges. More young black high school graduates uh, recognize that uh, they need to go to a nurturing, supportive environment that embraces them. And all too often what they're finding at predominantly white institutions is institutions that say they want black students, but still do not treat them in the same way that they treat their other students. The challenge that, that many of the young people have who want to go to historically black colleges is because our institutions are under-resourced. They don't always have the resources uh, to uh, provide scholarship support for the disproportionate number of our students who don't have the financial wherewithal to go to college. And, and uh, happily uh, for us, we've seen a couple of trends, which if they continue, could mean a, a sea change in opportunity for young black people who want to attend historically black colleges. One, that the federal government is taking a much more significant role in investing in historically black colleges. Both the stimulus acts that were passed last year provided set-aside funds for historically black colleges and other minority serving institutions. And we've seen in the Biden-Harris administration an extraordinary commitment to investing in our historically black colleges and universities and supporting low-income students. So if, if, for example, they double the Pell Grant and most of our students rely upon Pell Grant or that they make uh, uh, tuition at historically black colleges and other minority serving institutions are uh, free, then we think that we'll see an, a significant increase in uh, our institutions uh, being able to not only admit students, but to, that they will have the financial support that they need to, uh, to persist and to thrive and to complete. Because you know the most important thing that the journey that these young people need to be on is the pathway to a college degree, because a college degree is the surest pathway from poverty into a more sustainable uh, family income. What did it mean for historically black colleges and university now to have someone in the White House? And I, I don't mean there's a lot of people who work for the government <laughs> who uh, went to HBCU to use, but I think you know the person I'm talking about. I think I know who college. you are talking about. You know what I'm talking about, right? Right now, you I know you do. Two groups of people, anything. Uh, Howard grads and AKAs. You can't tell them anything right now. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> and let me say, it was kind of hard to tell Howard grads something to begin with because they all, That's they know right. it all. all right, so yeah, so I'm a Morehouse man. And you know what they say about Morehouse grads? You, you can tell, a, you can always tell a Morehouse man, you just can't tell him much. Uh, so, you know, I think that, I think it is incredible that we have a role model in Kamala Harris. I, I think it's incredible for two groups of people. One is just incredible for young black uh, women and girls, that they see someone who looks like them, who uh, is, 
is one of them at the highest levels of our government. But I also think it's very important for white America because uh, Kamala Harris is someone who resonates with everyone. And then they say, and oh, by the way, she went to a historically black college. Now, black folks know there are historically black colleges and we know they're important. Uh, and we and they know that and we know that they produce extraordinary people. I mean, look at all the mayors, for example, right now. We just elected uh, an HBCU grad to be mayor of St. Louis, the mayor of New Orleans, the mayor of Atlanta, the mayor of Birmingham, the mayor of Montgomery, the mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. All of those are HBCU grads. Forty uh, percent of all the members of the Congressional Black Caucus are HBCU grads. So you see that we've been producing leadership. But I think Kamala Harris really is a beacon to the nation and to the world of the powerful impact of a historically black college education. She says the two great forces in her life were her mom and family and Howard University. That's quite a, uh, an endorsement. And I think that's really the story that these institutions have been telling. They have been under-resourced, undervalued, underinvested in, but they've been outproducing others. And just think, Jamel, what an incredible impact they can have if they actually get more investment and have the resources to do even more. Uh, and let's not forget the unofficial mayor of America, Stacey Abrams, who I believe went to Spelman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think of Stacey, I got to just say, I think of Stacey Abrams as the uh, the champion of all voters in this nation. I think she's doing such an incredible job. And she's a demonstration of what our institutions produce. Spelman College, her parents are Tougaloo graduates from, uh, from Mississippi. I mean, you know, we've been doing this work for a long time and we have been producing freedom fighters and champions and advocates and artists of incredible note. Uh, we just, I think we're in a renaissance now and we're seeing an even greater flourishing of the talent that comes out of HBCU. Uh, really quickly before we, um, uh, we, before we have to go, unfortunately, uh, you talked about um, that investment that this administration is making in to HBCUs. In your mind, is that the key to HBCU, HBCUs competing for the future? Is it the financial investment part that's the foundation for everything that HBCUs can accomplish in, a few, accomplish Look, in the future? It, 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 uh, re financial resources are the mother's milk of education. We have to have great teachers. We have to have great uh, you know, laboratories and facilities for our students. So the federal investment is key because the federal government makes such a big investment in higher education. But there is also an extraordinary opportunity for corporations and philanthropy. Last year, uh, we did see some incredible philanthropists step up to join Robert Smith, uh, Mackenzie Scott, uh, Reed Hastings and Pat Patty Quillen, uh, Bruce and Martha Karsh, a number of people who gave significantly so that this last year was probably a billion dollar year in terms of giving to HBCUs, along with the billions of dollars that came from the federal government. But that's just in one year. And what we really need to see is those those same philanthropists, those foundations, those corporations, not just talking about doing this work, but actually investing in this work. The technology companies with all of their great wealth, the banks with all of their great wealth. Are they reinvesting in America's future and in the future of the black community? Are they investing in our most important resource, our young people, and helping to produce the college-educated black community of the 21st century? That's my challenge to all of them, and they must do more. Well, thank you um, for issuing that challenge and for all the work that you do in getting so many uh, young people to attend HBCUs, obviously providing them with very necessary uh, funding. As somebody who went to a predominantly white institution, I'm very aware not only of the legacy of HBCUs, but also just how important and vital they are 
to us having a functioning, flourishing community. So I thank you for your work and for this conversation. And now back to you, Candace. Thank you.